Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Grant, O Lord, we pray that the course of this world may be peaceably ordered by thy governance, that thy church may serve thee in all godly quietness and joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now for him, 526. <clears throat> Let saints on earth in concert sing with those whose work is done for all the servants of our King in heaven and earth are one. Well, we continue our work with Prof. Davidson Hunter. Um, I read this once before. I've got some notes all the way through. It's fun to read the margins of what I was thinking back then. Uh, we do want to take up uh, the study later, God willing, of the closing the American mind, and maybe Christopher Lush's The Culture of Narcissism, as further commentary uh, in cultural theology. There's Old Testament, New Testament, systematic theology, church history, practical theology, and contemporary theology. You might want to have apologetics spread across all six fronts, but as B.B. Warfield wanted done. We pick up here the century-old fault lines. Again, we're featuring the, the professor, not yours truly. This is about what the professor thinks. With the tremendous rivalry and antagonism among religious traditions in the late 19th century, it would have been impossible then to have anticipated the kind of changes in the cultural landscape that were to take place a century later. Yet fissures emerged within each of the distinct traditions of Protestantism, Romanism, and Judaism that were not only remarkable, par remarkably parallel in character, but also were simultaneous or simultaneous to the closing decades of that century. These fissures would evolve into major fault lines over which the contemporary culture war was now fought. What shape did these fissures take, and how did they develop? One of the fractures taking shape in the three historic faiths, those that occurred in Protestantism, are best known. But at all three cases, breaks appeared at each community as each community struggled to cope with the intellectual and social dilemmas posed by life on the verge of the 20th century, labor struggles, public health issues, rising crime and poverty, all problems that had been brought about by industrialization and urbanization. Deep ethnic distrust and political instability had been the fruit of the rapid immigration and slow assimilation of foreign populations. The credibility of religious faith had been weakened by higher criticism, thank you, historicism and the advances of science. Interestingly, the way in which we're going to look up this word, exactly what do they mean by historicism, probably some version of relativism it's, gets used a lot of use. As each community of faith responded organizationally, in Protestantism, and fissures were reflected within denominational structures, seminary education, and lay attitudes. In Romanism, they were reflected almost exclusively in the opinion and policy initiatives of the bishops. In Judaism, the ruptures took place in the formation of new denominational structures, organizational differences aside. The substance of the response in each tradition was remarkably similar. Progressivist initiatives, well, we're gonna change that because we're, we're gonna see they're hardly progressive. want to talk about the degeneration and devolution of these retrogressives. By the 1870s and 1880s, it became clear to many leaders of all faiths that the problems posed by modern industrial capitalism were unlike any that had been confronted before. The effort to respond to these solely by attempting to evangelize the unsaved and to curb the vices of intemperance prostitution and profanity is held by the pietists in the Protestant tradition was quickly 
quite quite the word pietists about those who love God's law, see his sovereignty. New and creative strategies emerge and merge or needed. In Protestantism, the intellectual and programmatic response came in the social gospel movement. Of the late 19th century, its advocates slowly came to reject an individual explanation of the afflictions of modern life in favor of a more structuralist explanation. It was not so much sin and personal moral failure that were to blame for human hardship as it was the brutal power of contemporary social and economic institutions. Yeah, he's being descriptive here. The only lasting solution would be found through institutional measures of redress. It was here in addressing the problems of labor, the demand for industrial education, expanding requirements of poor relief, and the necessity of a spirit of Christian com communitarianism in public life that the modern church could most effectively serve the cause of Christianity. By the 1890s, an enormous literature advocating the tenets of the social gospel was being published by the churches. Translate the social creed of the churches was published in 1908. <clears throat> Translating these tenets into programmatic agenda was the motivation <clears throat> for the new organizations such as the Brotherhood of the Kingdom, the Department of Church and Labor of the Presbyterian Church and the Board of Home Missions, the Meta Methodist Federation for Social Service. A significant corollary of the social gospel movement, and in many ways a component of it, was a new spirit of denominational cooperation. This was reflected in such church bodies as the Evangelical Churches of Christendom, 1900, <clears throat> the National Federation of Churches and Christian Workers, 1901, the Federal Council of Churches, 1908, the first two groups failed not long after they were founded, but the FCC endured both as an effective ecumenical agency and as an important symbol of the ecclesiastical spirit of the age. At one level, the FCC represented a concern to develop interdenominational toleration as it ended itself. But above all, it represented the recognition throughout the Protestant world that if churches were to effectively address the problems of an industrial age, they would have to face them together. Innovations were being pursued among Protestantism's intellectual elite. At root was the need to reconcile traditional theology with the discoveries of modern scientific theory. The challenge posed by Darwin and Huxley was only one of the many <clears throat> other intimidating quests. Tests came in breakthroughs in astronomy, psychology, sociology, and philosophy, which demanded that interpretation, traditional interpretations of the Bible be reconciled with the methods of modern intellectual investigation. Historicism and higher criticism were powerful intellectual movements in European scholarship and they filtered into the discourse of the American academic community that could not be ignored. The net effect of all these pressures was something of a synthesis of the old and the new, a novel and bold re-symbolization. And that synthesis is really about syncretism, the age-old dynamic to incorporate Baal into Yahweh's worship. The most important reworking of the traditions involved the de-emphasis of the supernatural aspects of the biblical narrative and an almost exclusive emphasis upon its ethical aspects. Another way to put that is dethroning God as to his character. But a sociologist here does not have that category. But he's getting some things right, too. Such theological innovations not only allowed the mainline Protestant church to keep pace with intellectual currents of the period, but they also provided much intellectual legitimation, 
legitimation. So there are new programs of social activism as well. Within Catholicism or Romanism, liberal or progressive initiatives came in the 1890s, primarily in the form of new attitudes and policies articulated by particular bishops in the American hierarchy. In part, new social approach approaches were associated with the rights of labor, particularly in support of the Knights of Labor, a Romanist precursor of the labor union. The desire to cooperate with Protestants in the realm of education also played a role. But the movement that came to embody these progressive Romanist ideas more prominently than any other was more prominent than any other Americanist movement. Among its heroes were Father Isaac Hecker, founder of the Paulist Fathers, Archbishop John Ireland, John J. Keene, Rector of Catholic University of America, and Bishop Dennis O'Donnell, among others. At the heart of the Americanist movement in the Catholic hierarchy <coughs> was the desire to integrate the U.S. Catholic Church into the mainstream of modern society. The Americanists sought to phase out what they considered unessential Romanist traditions and to present the Catholic faith in a positive light to the Protestant society. They hoped for to eliminate the foreign caste quotes of the church by Americanizing the immigrant population through language and custom as quickly as possible by celebrating and promoting the principles of religious liberty and the separation of church and state and by helping to foster America what American style democracy globally. By the 1890s, the Americanist movement acquired a more universal appeal by associating itself with progressive views of biblical, theological, and historical scholarship uh, emanating from Europe. The association was built upon mutual affinities the Americanists' praise of religious liberty, the European modernists' advocacy of subjectivity in theology. I saw something yesterday. Who was it? Was it uh, James Packer talking about the subjectivity of Bart's Christology? Bart's theology? And the Gnosticizing influence of and subjectivizing of the New Testament by Rudolf Boltman. To avoid the New Testament, we would add, the modernist movement within the American Catholic scholarship was fairly modest at the beginning of the 20th century. A journal of Romanist modernist thinking, the New York Review, was founded in 1905. A few scholars published articles advocating the compatibility of evolution and the official teachings about the doctrine of creation or the use of higher critical methods of biblical interpretation. The heart of Catholic Romanist modernism was in Europe. Yet whether European or American, the retrogressivist, that's my word, theology of modernism was associated with and found support in the American movement. As will be seen, the rapprochement was of serious consequences for the direction of the American church within that very decade. The retrogressivist impulse in Judaism had its origins as early as the German Enlightenment in the 18th century. The inchoate movement was small and somewhat formless through the first half of the 19th century, but with the immigration of German Jews to America after the 1850s, the idea would lead to reform Judea, Judaism flour, flourishing. <clears throat> the earliest reformers had no intention of establishing a new denomination, but rather aspired to shape the religious ethos of all of Judaism. The Union of the American Hebrew Congregations, 1873, the Rabbinical Seminary, Hebrew Uni Union College, 1875, the Central Conference of American R Rabbis, were all founded to serve the needs of Judaism as a whole. Even before the turn of the century, they provided the institutional nucleus of what was to become just one branch 
of American Jewry, the Reform Movement. As with <clears throat> the Catholics, accommodation to American life and purpose was perhaps the dominant inspiration behind the retrogressivist Jewish thought. To that end, worship service was shortened, the vernacular was introduced, the use of the organ was sanctioned, and the segregation of men from women in all aspects of worship was ended. More important than these modifications, though, were the theological accommodations. <clears throat> the decisive move away from traditional belief and ritual observance towards ethical idealism. These theological alterations had became crystallized first in a series of resolutions drawn up by progressives in Philadelphia in 1869, and then more formally in the Pittsburgh Platform of 1885. In these documents, progressives maintained that rabbinical Judaism, based on the ancient law and tradition, had forever lost its grip on the modern Jew. The only viable course, therefore, was to reinterpret the meaning of Judaism in light of new historical developments. The entire range of traditional rabbinic beliefs and practices were abandoned. The first to be rejected was the traditional conviction that the Torah or Jewish law was unalterable, that it was somehow sufficient for the religious needs of the Jewish people at all times and places. Accordingly, the doctrine of the bodily was resurrection was declared to have no religious foundation, as were the concepts of Gehenna and Eden, hell and paradise. Repudiated as well were the laws regulating dress, diet, purification, and excessive rit ritualism of traditional worship. And not least, the messianic hope of a restored Jewish state under the son of David was also disavowed. In their stead was the <clears throat> affirmation of the universalism of Hebraic ethical principles, the idea that Judaism was the highest conception of the God idea. Having abandoned any conception of Jewish nationalism, the mission of Israel was now to bring the ethical ideals of the Jewish tradition to the rest of the world. Remarkable for the historical context in which they were made, the documents even extended the hand of ecumenical cooperation to Christianity and Islam. As daughter religions of Judaism, they were welcomed as partners in Judaism's mission of spreading monotheistic and moral truth. In large measure, the ethical truths they desired to proclaim could be translated into the language that harmonized with the Protestant social gospel. As stated in Principle 1 of the 1885 Pittsburgh Manifesto, Reformed Jews would commit themselves to regulate the relations between the rich and the poor to help solve the problem represented by the contrasts and evils of the present society. On to the next category, Orthodox Reactions. Given such reformist pluck, nice word, it would have been odd not to expect strong counteraction within each tradition. In all three traditions, leaders who were equally articulate, vocal, and powerful were convinced that the progressive changes being advocated represented nothing short of apostasy. They rose up to defend the faith as it had been inherited from generations past. The protests launched by the defenders of orthodoxy within Protestantism centered upon the defense of the scripture. By demonstrating that the Bible was the word of God, inerrant in all its teachings, they felt confident that they would have adequate foundation to reject heresy and prevent the ordinary believer from straying into impiety and irreligion. Accordingly, dozens of Bible institutes and colleges across the country were founded, including Moody Institute, originally founded for urban ministry in 1886, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, 1930, St. Paul's Bible College, 1916, First Baptist Bible College, 1921, Columbia Bible College, 1923, among others. 
annual Bible conferences also came to serve this purpose. The Niagara Bible Conference, the American Bible and Prophetic Conference, the Northfield Conferences, the Old Point Comfort Bible Conference, the Seaside Bible Conference, among others. A flurry of new periodicals defending the Orthodox cause were published. Bible Champion, the Baptist Watchman, the Truth, the King's Business, Prophetic Times, Waymark in the Wilderness, and so on. Perhaps the most daring effort to defend the Orthodox faith was the public and sweeping distribution of the fundamentals in 1910. This 12-volume work included over 90 articles systematically cataloging and defending the major doctrines of the Christian faith, discrediting the Mormon, Roman Catholic, Christian science, and spiritualist heresies summarizing all of the major archaeological evidence that confirmed the truth of the Old Testament stories and refuting the methods of higher criticism. Finally, the effort to stem the pernicious influence of Bible-denying Darwinian theory of evolution in the public schools. 37 anti-evolution bills were submitted to 20 state legislatures between 1921 and 29. In the American Catholic hierarchy, the situation was different. Orthodoxy within Romanism has always been defined more by fidelity to the teaching emanating from the Holy See than it is by adherence to specific doctrinal positions. Thus, intervening within the intra-Romanist tensions in America was the presence of the Vatican itself. By the end of 1899, Pope Leo XIII made his views known. His opinion came in the form of the apostolic letter, Testum Benevolentiae, and though he was not totally condemnatory, his censure was still broad and effective. In the eyes of the Vatican, the Americanists' idea of presenting the truths of the Catholic Church positively in Protestant context was seen as watering down of doctrine. Their praise of religious liberty was praised, perceived as the praise of religious subjectivism and their desire to accommodate the Catholic Church to American democratic institutions. The papal condemnation of Americanism was significant for many reasons, but one of the most important is that it proved to be a precursor to the denunciation of modernism in American and European Catholic scholarship as well. The Vatican viewed the two movements as allied and therefore it moved quickly to quell the latter in the manner it had silenced the former. In 1907, Pope Pius X condemned modernism in the Paschkendi Dominici Gregis. I believe there was a Roman Catholic priest I uh, worked with, he, and he was a vigorous priest. He, he's out in California now, somewhere retired. He said he had to take an oath to support this document for promoting subjectivist tendencies in theology, as well as adopting some of the principles of the Americanists. In 1908, the modernist periodical, the New York Review, ceased publication almost immediately after a few of its articles had come under the direct scrutiny of Rome. In 1910, also due to the direct mediation of the Holy See, an associate professor of biblical studies at Catholic University was dismissed for disagreeing with the ordinary magisterium. He had rejected the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. The it's interesting to see the Roman response they, they're on to the same issues that the uh, true Catholics are on. The character of the traditionalist reaction within Judaism was different still. Historical Judaism in the United States and Europe was very simply orthodoxy. Up to the mid-1800s, the Orthodox had no real self-image of themselves as a movement within American Judaism. They were Judaism in America. There were, of course, those who attempted to modify and moder modernize their traditions, but plainly they were not in good standing with the conventional 
and taken for granted understanding of Jewish faith and life. But the pronouncements of the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh platforms forced the traditionalists for the first time to think of themselves and struggle to survive self-consciously as defenders of the true faith. All traditional Jews interpreted the Pittsburgh Statement of 1885 as an insult and immediately proceeded to sever their relations with the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. Likewise, Hebrew Union College was declared unfit to educate the next generation of rabbis. But beyond this, the response varied. The most orthodox and observant Jews found themselves a beleaguered and ghettoized minority, with few adherents and little resources. Of approximately 200 major Jewish congregations in existence in the 1880s, only a dozen of these, representing three to 4,000 people, remained strictly orthodox. The larger portion of traditionalists pursued compromise. These traditionalists remained committed to traditional practice and teachings, but they were also committed to the political emancipation and westernization of Jewish experience. They recognized that this would entail modifications to orthodoxy, but they were persuaded these changes should only be made according to Talmudic precedent with the consent of the whole community of believers. By 1913, after the founding of 1900, in 1901 of the Rabbinical Assembly of America and the establishment of the United Synagogue of America in 1913, a national union of the conservative synagogues, the conservative movement had become a powerful force in American Judaism. Well, that's enlightening. It's more enlightening than the American religious, religions course I had at seminary. We'll have to do, he's done some very good work there. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, help us to understand your providence and to understand the intersectionality of your word as the canon in our culture, speaking to our culture and to our present situation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.